uh, years of uh, experience with uh, online streaming, so online lectures were not a problem, online meetings with people uh, who were not in the same city or uh, when you were locked into your home, and even online conferences. So here is a screenshot of the UMAP conference in the first year of the pandemic. People were toying around, uh, they enjoyed themselves being at home, uh, showing parts of their own living room, still having all those meetings, etc. So we thought it was great, at least during the first year. Um, so after uh, the pandemic uh, slowly ended, um, the intentions of SIGWAP and SIGWAP conferences were to keep hybrid conferences and meetings uh, in because it would save a lot of travel time for people who were just attending one session, as I do now here at uh, uh, the Kai Greece. Um, also, reducing our traveling to meetings that are just very short and can also be done online would have a very positive impact on our ecological fo footprints. And also, people from developing countries and others who could, couldn't travel due to finance issues or visa problems, they still could attend the conference to a certain extent. So, immediately after the pandemic, uh, we st started experimenting with hybrid conferences again. Uh, promoting this among conference organizers, stimulating uh, hybrid attendance. And it turns out now a year after the pandemic that people actually hated those hybrid conferences uh, from different perspectives. So even though technology is there, it still takes quite some effort to set up a, full, a meaningful hybrid setting. So I have the feeling that you succeeded in doing that quite well up there in Greece. Um, but also online participation, particularly when you need to attend a conference for several days and eight hours a day in your living room, that's far less engaging than being present. And after all, people go to conference, not just for watching people presenting, but also for networking, talking about what's happened at the conference, catching up with colleagues, etc. And there was also the fear that universities could actually prevent PhD students uh, from traveling and saving money by doing so, preventing PhD students from actually networking uh, with people, meeting uh, senior researchers, etc. <coughs> Sorry. So Hibbert conferences, as we envisaged that a year ago, did not really develop. And this year, um, uh, many conferences were mainly on site. And we currently try to experiment with uh, some on site plus uh, conferences, where only parts of conferences would be. Uh, uh, would be streamed or recorded, such as the keynotes or the panels. Um, and there are some successful online workshops. So there is an International Hypertech Summer School coming up. Um, there is uh, the Human Workshop, um, which also um, takes place fully online, uh, but broadcast from an existing conference. Um, if hybrid meetings would not be possible, then I would have had to fly to Chicago for just a one or two day ACM meeting in November. Um, so that would save a lot of travel money yet. So a lot of things that we learned during COVID will stay. And I think we learned a lot from it, not just from a usability perspective, but also from how to adopt this technology. And I think it's here to stay and we still need to uh, fully embrace those kind of things, being on site where useful, doing things online uh, where possible. So that's my very brief introduction, and I happily hand over to uh, to my next one. You're muted. Thank you, uh, Elko. Thanks again. Uh, so uh, from uh, Sig Web back to Sig uh, Kai and uh, Keith uh, Instone, the co-chair for partnerships in the Sig Kai Executive Committee. He has uh, shared his, uh, his time uh, between uh, academia and uh, industry, and uh, he, he focuses on exploring the community needs in terms of collaboration. So he, he started it all by planting a seed by his communication. So his, uh, his uh, quest is uh, successful so far. Keith, uh, uh, to you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me okay? Good. Great. Um, 
great. I'll, I'll breeze through some things because many things I want to say have already been said. Um, I'll just start with my journey in this also started in 2005, working with Elizabeth for World Usability Day. Um, that really sort of kicked it off for me as, as, as a passion, as part of my career. Uh, something happened in 2010, and a lot of people were talking about uh, academy, academia and industry collaboration, research and practice collaboration. So lots of things going on at that point. Um, so there's sort of a, a nexus and I've, I started documenting things for me personally about every year or two I would, you know, I still had a day job and I had other things to focus on but I, I would devote some time each year to try to to move the ball forward on this as a topic, um, even at some point doing a doing a research project with some colleagues in academia at, at Michigan State and publishing papers doing research and publishing papers about uh, how to help uh, user experience practitioners collaborate with HCI researchers, for example. Um, and here we are today talking about um, uh, earlier um, this year, I joined the, the, the SIGCHI executive committee to help push the ball forward. Um, but let me just sort of, the, the, the stories that I hear talking to mostly to user experience practitioners and HCI researchers, when I talk to practitioners, you know, they're, they're getting paid to do a job, but they're struggling. They're, they, they, they need more confidence, credibility, knowledge. A lot of them, um, you know, are doing the practice, but they don't have the theory and the, and the research based on it. They're just sort of, they feel like they're making up as they go along. Um, for me, I have a background in HCI, so I at least am more confident about it, but a lot of folks come from different, different, different disciplines, and when they get a UX job, they, they really don't have a, sort of a, a scientific or an academic home. When I talk to students, like students have a great time in, in class, and they think it's just going to be also, um, you know, awesome, awesome in industry. So, you know, uh, I try to give them some, some practical advice to get ready for it, not to scare them away, but to let them know things in the industry won't be as, uh, as pure as they are in the classroom. Um, when I talk to teachers, you know, this is extremely hard to teach. It's a fast moving thing. And unless you're like, they often say like, unless I was uh, like half-time practitioner, half-time teacher, it's, it's really hard to teach this stuff. So again, how, how can we help the teachers, uh, prepare the students better. And then for, for the researchers, you know, uh, many researchers want, want their, they want their research to have an impact. That means they need some practitioners. They need people in the industry to pick it up and do good things with it, right? So, so all of this leads to what is usually just called the gap, right? There's a gap and we've talked about the gap and how do we close the gap, bridge the gap and all those other things. So, so this is an ongoing thing. It's not like we can just um, hold one, hold one awesome Kai conference and the gap is closed, but that's just sort of how it's been phrased. Um, so most recently for me, I've joined uh, the SIGCHI executive committee to, to push forward on partnerships. So we have, have a new committee that I'm the co-chair of. Um, and the idea behind it is HCI has always been interdisciplinary, lots of different uh, backgrounds contributing to it. You know, uh, within ACM, we sort of have the computer science core, but a lot of that is, is reaching out to other, other disciplines. Um, but because what we're finding is, you know, other, other folks, you know, within computer science, across computer science, all want to make the technology fit better for users. Some of the, the things that Elizabeth has talked about with the World Usability Day, right? We have these common goals to save the planet and uh, have technology help us do that. So, so there's reasons for us to work together. So in general, for our partnership committee, we want to just loosely unite the, unite the field across disciplines, but also across geographies, knowing that you know, SIGCHI as a global organization also has to work at a more local level and at a regional level. Uh, in general, we're, you know, we're, we're out looking for cooperating societies is, is the term that we've used in the past, starting off by just cross promoting and letting people know that, hey, if you're a SIG Chi member, there's some cool stuff happening even over on SIG Web, right? Even uh, many folks don't even know what's happening in the other SIGs, right? Um, in addition to what's happening uh, in, in uh, lots of other groups. Um, we want to do special projects and evolve those relationships. And uh, it's, it's, it's at two levels. One, just within academia, right? Just getting the, you know, I've been talking to lots of folks in the responsible AI community, and we have a lot in common with the HCI community. And then as we've already talked before, uh, with industry, my background's in user experience. So I'm constantly tugging user experience practitioners into the HCI community. So that's all I have to share to keep it quick and happy to have some more conversations. I've got 20 more slides that I could share, but we'll just keep it quick for now. Great, uh, thanks uh, Keith. And uh, just a quick reminder for uh, everyone on site that there's a slide going on. You can uh, find it in your bugs in your registration kit. 
it's a hashtag KaiGrist 2023 panel, the, the code, but you can also scan it, also available in the, uh, in the website. So uh, our first, uh, thank you, Keith, again, uh, our first representative from uh, the industry, Rosie Cella Drosu. She has been, uh, uh, she has a very long business title, uh, business manager, CSR, and uh, SAP University Alliances. And her studies include communication, new media, and psychology. Her research uh, focuses on uh, emotional intelligence and positive parenting, very interesting, with applications on her uh, three uh, lovely daughters. Uh, her uh, talk is related to SAP's research and educational activities. So, uh, Rosie, uh, I think you're up. Hello, hello. Very delighted to be the, here with you today. George, are you sharing my screen? Uh, will you share my presentation? So I will uh, start just, uh, oh, just presenting. Already shared, already shared. Okay. okay. So um, I'm here to represent business. And uh, I'm very, very happy that we all, uh, we are sharing the same vision on collaboration. And SAP Purpose, if we can please just skip to the, the next slide on the SAP Purpose. Yes, SAP Purpose is to help the world run better and improve people's lives. As we work each day to fulfill this purpose, technology is at the core. Today, SAP, <clears throat> today, SAP solutions are running the most mission critical systems at business and organization around the globe. So our focus is enabling our customers with the innovation they need to achieve their purpose. George, next slide, please. <clears throat> Apologize, uh, I'm a little bit uh, ill, but I'm here with you today. So uh, YSCP, because we enable our customers to become an intelligent and sustainable enterprise. <clears throat> This overview is so key fact of SAP as a leading software company on a global a global level, uh, with a global network of customers, partners, employees, and uh, thought leaders. As I stated earlier, SAP helps the world run better and improves people's lives. Uh, SAP innovation helps thousands of customers worldwide work together more more efficiently and use business insights more effectively. Next slide, please. <clears throat> <clears throat> With our consistent focus and investment over many, many years, uh, SAP now has more than 5.5 uh, million uh, companies participating in our business network across 119 countries. So this enables the path toward a network economy across every industry. And uh, uh, just let's imagine for a second, what can we achieve if we extend this power uh, beyond just accelerated growth and productivity and into sustainability. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So together we aspire to enable every customer to achieve zero emissions, zero waste and zero inequality. Next slide, please. <clears throat> ensuring, no, but, but uh, ensuring business success me means investing in not only the, gener the next generation of technology of solutions, but also the next generation of talent. In, today, in today's world, we see a first competition for talents around the globe, especially the one with digital skills. We see also a change in how education and learning is conducted and consumed from classical classroom to experiential and self-based learning. We also see a strong wish of the next generation to live and work with purpose and in sustainable ways. That's why we created a SAP University Alliances, a global community for students, universities, schools, and, and, and education, educational partners who are passionate about innovation and technology. <clears throat> Can we move to the next slide, please? <clears throat> Our community leverages more than 3,000 educational institution, uh, institutions in uh, over uh, 100 countries. 
we introduce students and faculty to SAP solution by providing networking and educational, acti educational activities to build digital skills. We provide to faculties access to teaching and learning environments uh, for SAP solutions. And of course, we foster in, um, in many different ways close partnership with academic community. Can we please move to the next one? As I already stated, uh, stated, we aim to motivate the next generation to learn about business application for the intelligent enterprise. Why? So they know how to run and work uh, in an intelligent digital enterprise, may it be at SAP or in our ecosystem of partners or uh, our customers. So they know how to shape their own future by acquiring state-of-the-art digital skills and by realizing uh, their own view, vision on the, of, of the world of tomorrow. So they know how to have a meaningful impact on the world, turning their purpose into action. Next slide, please, George. <clears throat> so, um, we at, uh, at SAP, we comprehend what new era brings and what academia and students need. And I would like to show what our organization in practice is offering to tackle the big challenges. We are working consistently in order to create the opportunity to bridge business and academia to solve the biggest problem. And in that respect, we have launched a student zone. Student Zone is a free learning resource as part of SAP learning platform for all students and faculties around the world. Student Zone is the place for students to learn more about SAP and technical, and, 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 and technical solutions, discover career opportunities, and connect with experts, peers, and other learners. Students are offered the opportunity to make learning journeys and develop in-demand skills in key innovation areas. Furthermore, students have the chance to be prepared for certification that demonstrate both their skills and interest in technology, boosting the, uh, their career chances. Next slide, please, George. <clears throat> Another opportunity is our, uh, is our collaboration with Coursera. Okay, Coursera is a well-known learning provider on a wide, wide range of uh, topics uh, to individual and organization worldwide. SAP partners with Coursera and launched its first SAP Technology Consultant Professional Certificate. This course delivers students SAP consulting skills, strength, strengthening um, student CVs with demonstrated um, certified skills. Students get the insight track on how to build a consulting career beyond having SAP product knowledge. The main focus of this course are okay, core uh, SAP consulting skills that are in demand uh, in the job market. And, uh, and, and, and next slide, please. Okay, you, we are already on the next slide. Uh, another great opportunity is the Business Process Open Lectures Initiative that the, it is hosted by SAP University Alliances in close collaboration with the University of Mannheim and the SOA people. The series will cover 21 virtual sessions in which students and faculties can see at first hand how companies run their business and how data drive decision making. In my opinion, Decision making and critical thinking are the most important skills, not only in business, but in our life in general. <clears throat> business process open lecturer is an opportunity. Please, uh, okay, okay, I will continue to present a little bit a uh, business uh, process open lecturer. Business process open lecturer is an opportunity to network with other students and professors around the globe and, of course, to increase job readiness. And since we moved to the next uh, slide, and now I'm uh, uh, close to, to, to summing up, uh, we will all agree that the era of digitalization and AI is changing the rules, and for soon we need a new way of thinking and acting. 
Connecting the industry and academia for a greater good is of essence. It is mandatory, not only in terms of innovation, but more, much more in terms of responsibility. We all have to work together in order to, to in order to solve and overcome the world's biggest challenges. Human technologies requires motivated and resilient human capital. Together, we can build sustainable, responsible, and inclusive services and solutions that can address critical challenges of our world. And are my final slide, George. I would rather say that our world is a world of opportunities. It is an opportunity to research, to learn, to co innovate, and work together for a more sustainable future. Very delighted that in this panel, we are sharing the same vision of collaboration. So it is a time to unleash the power of education and we can do this together. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Rosie. And uh, uh, so it's uh, our for first uh, on-site uh, a uh, speaker uh, feels kind of uh, like introducing your boss, our second uh, uh, ACM uh, special interest uh, uh, group uh, president uh, from CKI, associate professor at uh, Georgia Tech at the School of Interactive Computing. There's a School of Interactive Computing. Studied at Berkeley in uh, Stanford, uh, focusing on uh, human-centered computing and global development of so higher values. Also worked in uh, the industry at uh, Microsoft Office and PowerPoint. So if you have any uh, feedback, complaints, just uh, yeah. there. And uh, she's uh, really busy, but still has time to, to write this very long, uh, medium, uh, blog posts and the official one. So Neha, it's up to you. Can you hear me? Great. Uh, can I just get a show of hands of um, how many people here know what Sikai is? Okay, good. Let's start. Let's start with that. So how many of you know how many conferences Sikai sponsors? Sure. I don't have any prizes on me, but I'd love to know what you think. Do you have a number? Good. More than 20. Yes. About? More than 20 in the yeah. Concert. Close. Very close. Anyone else want to try? I can think of prizes to give. Okay. So I know there's at least one person in the, in the audience who knows Luigi, uh, who's also on the, on the Sikai executive committee, but so 26 conferences. Uh, and I know that if I wait for answers, it's a, a, a it's a short clock. So, um, uh, it is one of the largest SIGs in terms of the number of conferences, uh, that it sponsors. How many members do you think, uh, are in Sikai? People who actually pay for membership. Ten thousand? No, five thousand. We should we should aim for that. But in terms of the larger community, we have about um, fourteen thousand is the number I think thirteen fourteen thousand. So uh, yeah, it is it is a very large community. Um, so I just wanted to give you a sense of that first, right? So it is it is a large SIG, many conferences. Um, and uh, there are other details that you can go to our website for, and we're soon going to have a new website. So uh, stay tuned for that. Uh, a lot of uh, our updates are shared on our Medium publication, so I won't into, uh, go into those details. But what I do want to say today is kind of set the stage for our next uh, presentation. Uh, Sikai um, has certain priorities that we're focusing on right now. And, uh, you know, what we really want is for our communities, for our conferences across the world to thrive, right? And to create knowledge spaces that um, uphold these values. So firstly, we, we care about safety. Uh, we want our um, attendees to be safe. We care about accessibility, sustainability, equity. Um, 
we care about hybrid and we heard about that a little while back. Um, and certainly we believe that the future is hybrid, although it's still quite a challenging uh, experience to pull off successfully. And finally, we care about global inclusivity. And in um, with regards to global, we've been focusing on the... Um, uh, the hyper-local context, as well as sort of our, our overall global presence. And, um, you know, the overall global presence, while it, it's great, we have representation from a large number of countries, and that's been growing over time. But also with regards to the hyper-local and the regional, right, thinking about how our chapters come together, uh, thinking about how we can do many more such events like Kai Greece and support them throughout the world, right? This is something that we've really tried to focus on over the last few years. And uh, one of these initiatives that I'm so, so happy has, uh, has been in the works for the last couple of years is uh, around building a Mediterranean um, Sikai community. And of course, the community already exists. And of course, you all know that uh, there are ties uh, already in existence. But this was really an effort to formalize that so that there can be events that are of a more formal nature uh, and, and can get some more support, more active support from Sikai, uh, and also um, create stronger ties across this region. So, you know, when we have bigger conferences here, we can really pull on uh, that community to participate. So I wanted to set that up. I, I'm really, really grateful to Maristella Matera, who's a um, former uh, um, Italy chapter uh, chair, who really led this effort to, um, to drive this committee forward. And I know that many more in this room are involved in that effort. Uh, so I want to thank you for, for believing in it. Uh, enough to kind of push it forward. I'm really, really excited about how it's going to take shape um, in coming years. So with that, I think next up we have, do we have Marcella? Or do we, have uh, we, we were supposed to have her, but uh, she's uh, almost here. So uh, thank you, Neha. It's uh, uh, Marcella Matera was supposed to, to also attend physically the, the conference, but she tested positive for uh, COVID. And she couldn't make it. She's uh, also experiencing uh, uh, the, not a fever, etc. So she couldn't even connect online. But uh, uh, we'll present her as if she was here. Uh, Kai Italy Vice Chair, long long time chair, uh, full professor at Politecnico di Milano, leading the Human Centric Interactive Technology Lab, associate editor at uh, Transactions on the Web. She, she Kai and Web are closely connected and um, has uh, uh, she, she was the driving force for uh, Medikai so uh, but uh, you unfortunately you will have to to put up with, with me uh, so uh, Sikai committee uh, aiming to to foster collaboration cooperation between the uh, local chapters and overall uh, Kai communities in the Mediterranean uh, area. So it's kind of a meta uh, chapter uh, on this. Um, it was inspired and nurtured uh, from the overall Sikai uh, strategy in uh, connecting and collaborating and uh, uh, aiming to, to support, not replace uh, active local chapters and inspire and motivate them but uh, also to connect them, like uh, um, represent them towards uh, Sikai and other uh, entities as a whole. Uh, a bit of a, a background on the uh, uh, history. Started, uh, I, I searched my mails, it was like uh, a couple of years, 2021, I think, around this, this time of a uh, year. And uh, so, uh, and uh, started, uh, uh, we have ACM president, uh, Professor Iranidis with us. Perhaps he can uh, have a, a small, let, let me uh, complete the, the um, uh, MedKai uh, presentation because it's the actual announcement of MedKai, a formal uh, announcement. And we're having the kickoff later today, actually after this uh, panel. And uh, uh, it will. Uh, I'm going to focus on what Sikai, uh, Medkai won't do. It won't organize another conference, another uh, Med conference. It won't uh, interfere, or uh, it will 
motivate and inspire the chapters, but not interfere actually with their uh, function. And uh, it will not add bureaucracy, but rather uh, relieve it in order to represent it. Uh, it got the uh, executive committee uh, approval. And uh, as I said before, kickoffs uh, today, and uh, this is us, this is, um, uh, we have a whole survey that uh, we, we extracted these uh, points. And uh, uh, today we are um, talking about bylaws and other uh, formalities uh, in order to establish the, the committee. So uh, I think this is, uh, that is that. And perhaps uh, I, I'm not sure if uh, Professor Ioannidis would like to have a, a, a small intervention in, um, I just joined, so I'm not sure where uh, the discussion is. It, I, no, it's it's a great uh, honor, and thank you. Twi twice uh, in uh, in a day is, uh, is really uh, important and uh, uh, indicative of the support we are receiving from uh, ACM, uh, ACM SIGGAI, SIGWEB, and the rest of the entities. Absolutely. Just a uh, uh, hello, because uh, oh, you're also driving. So be be careful. I'm not all, driving. All I'm, driving. I'm driven. So I'm, okay. I'm, yes, yes. I, I'm not driving. Uh, so uh, th there's no issue. There's no issue there. No, I mean the topic of uh, of the of the panel is amazing. Unfortunately, I was on flight and then uh, I just got in the car. I, I missed some of the uh, entries, but uh, uh, the, the spirit of of what is being discussed is uh, right. You know. Uh, on target with uh, the vision and mission of ACM and, and of course, uh, uh, SIGCHI. So um, there's no point in me saying anything else. I'll be here listening. And if uh, further, further down in the discussion, I have to say something, I'll, I'll jump in. Great. Th thanks again. So uh, uh, instance of uh, mobile ubiquitous uh, computing uh, just uh, around the corner. So uh, our uh, next uh, uh, speaker is the second industry representative, uh, Mr. Dimitris Liras, director of uh, Liras Shipping, founder of Ulysses System and Learning. Uh, his background is in mechanical uh, engineering and uh, his research focuses on usability and flexibility in software, uh, combining cognitive processes uh, with corporate activities. So human and uh, uh, industry, corporate. He has impressive granted uh, patents in US, Taiwan, Japan, Canada, Russia, Israel, and pending in 15 countries. Over to you. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me here. This is a very, very impressive venue. Um, I'd like to just follow up on a point made by Professor May Maris. Uh, the, he mentioned that the industry, like, uh, like um, the industry I represent and the company I represent, is unconnected with academia on issues of uh, on issues of usability. I can answer why, I think I can answer why that's happening. The reason why that's happening is that the, the technology giants of this world, which are not dissimilar to the empires of previous uh, uh, occasions in history, are passing the technology to the industry, like myself, and they are passing their version of usability to me to my business. And uh, if I hire somebody, a student or a uh, developer or a designer or a, a software architect, they're going to come to me with the same uh, approach to usability that is coming from the giants. And that's not surprising. What we need, if, if you'll uh, accept my view on this, is we need Socrates. Socrates was an academic, and he was a a a, a a game changer. Now, why was an academic in a period that was not any less under the control of empires? It was. Why was he listened to? 
because he was loud enough or somebody was helping him be loud enough to come up and be heard. And whatever he's done is, is with us today, whatever he said. So it's a matter that industry, no matter how large and how encompassing of, of, of our IT industry, still needs people like Socrates. And they're out there. They're here. They're in universities. They're thinking. But they don't get sponsored for this. They don't get sponsored to produce a better way, a better usability standard or something better than the industry is producing. And it's not surprising. So the gap is the fact that the people that can improve the usability and can talk about it, can spread the word, are not being sponsored to do that. And it's not it's understandable, but it doesn't need to stay this way. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Liras. Uh, in the perspective of the industry is always uh, interesting and quite different from uh, the academic or research. And uh, we'll have hopefully time to discuss it uh, after the initial uh, talk. So last, but certainly uh, not least, Professor Konstantin Stefanidis, uh, long breath for one of the longest and most uh, intimidating uh, yet a really, really interesting uh, CVs. Professor at the Department of Computer Science, University of Crete, former director and current distinguished member of, at Forth, founder and head of the HCI Laboratory in the Ambient Technology Program on, and please be careful, 1988 and 2004 respectively. I repeat, 1988. So almost 35 years ago, a pioneer on uh, design for all and universal access, uh, editor-in-chief uh, at the uh, Universal Access in Information Society Journal and uh, Universal Access in HCI Conference, director, manager, director of the International Journal of Europe Computer Interaction. I think I have a pending review there, uh, one of the many that you have sent me. And, <laughs> and uh, a president, uh, recently a president of the National Hellenic uh, Accessibility Authority, right? So uh, his talk, as you may have guessed, is about uh, universal design and design for all. Over to you. Thank you, George. And uh, I would like to thank the um, organizer for this um, thoughtful invitation. I'm not hiding my age, but we don't need to um, <laughs> propagate it at the speed of light. He, he was very young when he, he established the, <laughs> He was very young, 18, I think. I, I am still young and very active. Um, reflecting on what Elizabeth said, uh, can, can, I, can I ask you to go through my... I would like to sit here. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Uh, let's go to the first one. Next one, please. Perfect. Thank you. Um, reflecting on what Elizabeth said, uh, our generation is called upon to cope with big world problems. And we're seeking to address these challenges, such as climate change, pandemics, and the like. And um, this requires global collaboration and cooperation. So these are the, the two um, keywords, uh, which are the topic of this year's World Usability Initiative theme and of this panel. Interestingly enough, uh, the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals, the famous SDGs um, set up in uh, 2015, and trying to uh, achieve something by <laughs> 2030. They are not doing very well. Uh, some have made uh, weak progress, uh, others have stalled, and some have reversed. So um, we all need to uh, work towards those. Um, next one, please. Going back to the early 90s, um, we borrowed from the field of architecture, and we have introduced in the international literature the concept of design for all in ICT, information and um, communications technologies, and in particular in HCI. Uh, so products and services 
would be accessible and usable by all citizens, compromised by most citizens, but abandoning nevertheless the notion of the hypothetical average user that was predominant in those days. So we gave a definition you can see, and following more than three decades of research and development work, the complexity of this endeavor has been addressed by producing appropriate frameworks, methods, and tools following a user-centered design approach that has been around since mid eighties, Don Norman and his colleagues, and by collaboration at the international level with interdisciplinary teams, stakeholders, and most importantly, target user groups. Next one, please. On um, the other side of the same coin lies the concept of universal access. And we introduce that to aim at the provision of access to anyone from anywhere at any time through a variety of computing platforms and devices to diverse products and services. Universal access encompasses the dimensions of diversity that emerge from a broad range of user characteristics the changing nature of human activities, the variety of contexts of use, the increasing availability and diversification of information, the variety of knowledge sources and services, and the proliferation of diverse technological platforms that emerge in the ever evolving technological landscape. It is interesting that after an initial period of skepticism and debate, universal access was widely accepted and was included by the United Nations in the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, adopted in 2008, six, and put into effect in 2008. Next one, please. Now, going from uh, the global to the local, um, since, as you said, the foundation of my group back in 1988, the um, R&D activities at the Institute of Computer Science of Forth, we have focused on promoting design for all and universal access. We've done many things, but this was the main focus of my activity for more than four decades now. And that will be also the focal point of my presentation tomorrow. Uh, in this context, th there is only one thing for me to add here today. An indispensable instrument in this endeavor has been the accessibility and user experience evaluation infrastructure that we have developed. It is a unique, flexible, and configurable infrastructure that we have utilized in the context of numerous local, national, and European, and international uh, collaborative projects, serving as a focal point for gaining a deeper understanding through user studies about the use of technology and the determinants of its acceptance. And the assessment of whether a particular technology truly serves actual user needs and requirements. Next one, please. Um, another pillar of collaboration relates to the wide dissemination of R&D results. And we have approached this in a number of ways a variety of educational and training activities, ranging from the usual, the standard, the tangible, addressing students and professionals, to something more intangible through the deployment in the community, uh, at home and abroad, of interactive systems that have we have developed with content that engages citizens at large in a variety of application domains. Publishing the results of our R&D activities, of course, um, and a little bit more challenging, organizing and leading collaborative efforts to publish influential white papers. Founding and editing journals and, and editing handbooks, establishing strategic partnerships with organizations and corporations nationally, internationally through framework agreements, and supporting the World Usability Initiative, including sponsoring 
the awards of the annual design challenge through the HCI International Conference. Last one, and next one, and last one, please. With a view to the future, as artificial intelligence, AI, services become more popular, and as we move forward to an AI-enabled landscape, it is important to acknowledge that wider collaboration will be in greater need. Furthermore, we need to account for human agent teaming, ensuring that this collaboration is fruitful, beneficial for humans, but also ethically aligned with our universal human values and goals. The key to achieving this goal is through human-centered AI, actively involving humans in the loop of design and development. However, we must be mindful that this is not trivial due to the large number of technical parameters involved, such as, for example, selecting the appropriate data set, developing the model, validating AI decisions, etc. And it is in this context, human-centered AI constitutes an emerging research domain for all of us. Why? Because HCI can assume a more prominent role, capitalizing our knowledge and expertise from applying the traditional human-centered design process that we've been doing for many decades now. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor Stefanidis. So it's uh, it's over to to you now. Uh, questions from uh, Slido, YouTube, Zoom, uh, etc., and live here in the audience. Uh, initially, thanks to all the panelists, panel members, for uh, their patience initially, and uh, at the end. <laughs> okay. So yes, we have a question. Yes. Yes. Um, it's very interesting what you said lately about the, the collaboration between humans and AI, which is, um, you see, collaboration, the basic thing is about having symmetricity in knowledge. So when you have non-symmetrical knowledge between those two agents, humans and uh, AI, what, what are your thoughts there? How can we collaborate with an agent that is far more, let's say, intelligent? Thank you. I, I also uh, wanted to focus on that and perhaps moving from uh, uh, interfaces to intelligence interaction, like uh, is this a paradigm that uh, is coming up? Um, thank you for this um, important uh, question. Um, I never said and I never meant that there is symmetry between uh, AI and the uh, person. And to help uh, go a little bit deeper, let's go back many decades when we started human computer interaction. Two black boxes, the human and the computer. And then they communicate, they interact, but each one bringing different uh, possibilities. And this has been systematically analyzed over decades, and it is in so many books and in so many papers. And what effectively we're doing is we're trying to extract from each black box what is the best and most effective way of communicating with the other partner. So the same will happen with AI, but the situation here changes only because the complexity uh, is far greater. And this was the point I was trying to make, that let's not try to do it the traditional way. We have got an exponential growth of parameters that need to be taken into consideration. And some of it I will be talking about tomorrow. Thank you very much. Teaser for the next keynote tomorrow morning. Uh, any other questions? Of course, Professor uh, Aburis. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you, George, for putting all this together. Uh, just it, it was Keith who started, or I just facilitated the process. Uh, you talked about this uh, med Kai idea, but then do we need more conferences? But you said we don't want uh, more. We want. Okay. We want. So can we have a bit more details on the 
how the modality of this is going to I, I, as soon as we decide it yes it, it's the the first the inaugural meeting is in a couple in like half an hour or so so we don't know yet so the bylaws have not been set we just have the uh, formal approval that we can proceed as a committee and set set the whole thing up, right? Okay, but I mean, with formal approval, since we have here our boss. Yes, the uh, boss, the boss is here. It, it would be interesting to know a little bit more on the modality of this. I mean, how to introduce a new conference, which perhaps is a good idea, put people together Great. across Mediterranean, but on the other hand, without sort of Great, great. Uh, good, good question. Like Perhaps uh, also to Neha, I would uh, complement it with uh, complement it with another question, also involving uh, uh, Elko's experience and the uh, hybrid uh, uh, conference and physical and remote. And uh, like I was having an idea that we could have a, a like a, a med consortium, doctoral consortium, or regular periodic meeting of students and mentoring much up or uh, the, the entire so apart from the strategic perhaps some uh, insights on the how are we is better to to organize it and, uh, and stuff yes. yeah let me jump let me jump in and and address that so firstly exactly what george said these decisions have not been made the people who are the key stakeholders would be the ones to make the decisions so that's number one right number two is we've had some experience with other com uh, committees so there is an asia committee there is a latin america uh committee that are already in existence and they've been uh uh, trying uh, to to really work with the chapters and with volunteers from the local chapters to see what are the activities that would be uh, synergistic with existing activities. So the goal is not to create another conference, but let's say um, uh, there are already conferences that happen in the area. How could those be um, amplified and and really serve the interests of the uh, regional committee. So uh, the DC is one example. There could be some ways of bringing together people in a doctoral consortium. That's kind of like, more broadly speaking, a workshop. There could be other events that are organized by chapters, but welcoming to other people in that community. So there's a few different things that we can talk about at, at length in terms of examples of, that other committees have taken on. Um, but really, it's a decision for, for people who would like to benefit from just a stronger network and stronger ties with others in the region. George, can I add? Just, just uh, Elko should uh, follow up perhaps and then uh, back to you, Nikos. I guess I don't have much to add here. So I think it's an excellent idea. But, okay, thanks. No, just uh, following your suggestion. Uh, now, the Mediterranean area is a, a border area. Now, we have Africa and Middle East, etc., and South Europe. So there, is, there are some, uh, perhaps, issues related to our area. Uh, now, going from the uh, UNESCO, uh, sustainability, and big, big words, perhaps we need somehow to focus on, on these specific areas, big challenges and how HCI and our community can face them and then create an agenda based on this, which needs a little bit of work. And then if you want to create a new brand, because I think conferences are brands. I mean, Kai is a really big thing uh, and international, etc. We have a few big brands. It could be a brand which can be associated and go along with local events following this but focusing most on the issues that are more relevant to our area, to our border area. So perhaps this can be some ideas that could, um, I mean, influence these guys who yes. have taken the initiative. Thank you. That's the short answer. Yes, definitely. Thank you. Thank you, Nikos. Perhaps also Elizabeth can uh, jump yes. in. Yes, I, I, I didn't see I didn't see your raised hand, but I was... Uh, I was trying to. With uh, all your experience in engaging... Uh, so many different communities, so many people you, you could uh, contribute. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, 
So first of all, uh, very happy to be here. I just want to say that again. Um, so part of what World Usability Initiative and, and you know World Usability Day really is all about, it's not creating any new brand. It's not creating any new activities. It's almost like I think Neha uh, you know, talked about this too. It's bringing together things that already exist. Actually, I don't think we have time to create new things. I think we have a lot to do. And so the idea is what's going on locally and then what's important locally. So we've always been about sort of, you know, think globally, act locally, again, Earth Day, but uh, as a model. So what is important, let's say, in, you know, Middle East Africa is certainly different than, say, the Northeast United States, right? So I wouldn't expect that, you know, these things look the same. So a lot of the themes, we've all the themes we've used over the it's almost 20 years for World Usability Day is all about that. It's like what's going on locally that relates to these global issues and and also to give agency to the local communities to a figure out what we need. I mean, I have to say, as an aside, I was speaking at the com uh, Compass and um, on one of these panels also that Shaina Lazan put together and and my question, and it was in Cape Town, right? And my question was, which of the 17 sustainable goals do you think we should focus on? And their answer, I have to say, I felt like, why didn't I think of this? They said, why are you starting with the sustainable goals? Why don't you start with what's going on down here that you need help with, right? And I like the reframing because maybe we think it's all these different things, but it's all about the local groups telling us or doing, not even just doing what's important in the local area. So hope that answered at least somewhat that question. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. Any any other uh, questions, comments, suggestions, uh, perhaps? Uh, Professor Mulas Costas. Mike uh, coming up. Thank you. Uh, AI brings uh, another way of interaction, simpler interaction between the human and the machine. Uh, the bots and the, the chatting that happens between the humans and machine, but new problems arrive about the ethics, the explainability, the black box understanding of the content, what happens, how the content is generated. Do you think that these problems are part of HCI community? It are something that belongs to our area or it's something that we need more scientific uh, topics or uh, areas to become. I think this one is for uh, Professor Stefanis, but I, I would also like to comment on that, yes. Okay, thank you again. Um, <clears throat> we, since late 50s, AI has been progressing on its own with ups and downs, um, with challenges and successes. And recently we have seen a re-emergence of AI with a different focus which brought it to our everyday life. Once we have AI in everyday life, then we have user interfaces, we have HCI issues. And the question is, the, fundamental, the first fundamental question is, do we allow the machine to make decisions on our part, or do we remain as humans in the loop, in the decision-making process? This is the first question that we need to answer. And some of us, and there is a community in the past few years that says, no, we should not allow the machine to take decisions on its own. We must be part of this decision-making process. And that's where human-centered AI came into being. Now, the, in, the, in the literature already, there are some publications, and there is a book by Ben Schneiderman, who is leading this particular effort, um, crying out loud, you know, do not allow the machine to take control of our lives. And in fact, he's talking about super tools and things like that instead of, um, instead of allowing machine to make decisions on our behalf. And there are already application domains, including the military, where the machine takes decisions with perhaps catastrophic uh, outcomes. So to cut the long story short, because this is a long story, uh, I think the benefit that we have as HCI community is to use 
our vast experience over the past decades and then say, look, we have come to some guidelines, some conclusions. Let's infuse them into the AI community who will not necessarily be welcoming in immediately everything, but I know the story in the 80s and the 90s. Communities are very um, resistant, if you like, to change. But in the end, if we are persistent, I think we can influence them positively for the benefit of mankind. Thank you. And I also agree that uh, AI had the, the ethics issue uh, long before it became interactive. So there are, it's more complex now. You have to deal with the AI per se and also the interactive part with the human in terms of ethics and uh, uh, boundaries and constraints, etc. So yes, human yes, of course, always human centered. We are. Uh, what panelists are ready to? Speak. Sorry, sorry, uh, Elizabeth wants. To, I, I'm not sorry. I didn't see you. And and Elko wants to comment on yes. that. Very interesting topic. I think uh, we'll having the 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 um, uh, drinks uh, here. So uh, Elizabeth and Elko, I didn't see who raised the, their hand first. So uh, it was me. It was me. I ladies know. Ladies first, of course. Yeah. So George, I've been in your situation actually at HCII. You got to look at the room, the panel. And then <laughs> who's ever talking online? But that being said, um, so I have been working in, in AI since not quite as long as Constantine. And I was also 12, not 18 when I started. But um, just to say that it's nothing new right now, right? Like AI has been around forever and we've all been working in it. I think these generative AI programs coming out to make it accessible for everyone certainly raises it as um, Constantine said, but at the end of the day, we're humans. So uh, my first dis sort of reaction to this conversation goes back to our first question um, where the person, and I can't see the audience, so I don't know, but they asked, um, what happens if you interact with, you're a person, you're interacting with a machine that's more intelligent than you. So I immediately, and that's why that I reacted to that, I immediately feel like, let's first just talk about what is intelligence, not to get too esoteric, but we're humans, we're intelligent. The only intelligence the machine has is what we as humans have given it. So if we are starting to say that now the machine's more intelligent than us, I'm not sure what that says about humans. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we have agency, as, as Constantine was saying, the issue is not AI is going to take over the world. What are we going to do? It's we're humans working with machines that we are creating. Sorry, I get very <laughs> worked up about this, but yeah, so yes, and I just to wrap real quick, it's up to us as, as a HCI people to make um, AI HCAI. And unless we make it human centered, I don't think it's it, we're going to help ourselves. So that's it. Um, I'll, I'll it's, see. Uh, all about values as many things in life. Elko, uh, you wanted to comment something. Yes. So first of all, I completely agree with Elizabeth here. Um, there are many HI aspects of AI that we should investigate. Um, I've written a, a book chapter about it recently, uh, which is about feedback loops between uh, humans and uh, AI, basically, or recommender systems, where I think some interface uh, paradigms, such as the feed, as you can see in social media, or in list of recommendations, really, really influence, influences our uh, freedom of choice. So we can choose what is being offered and we don't see what is not being offered. Now that we have the st start of voice assistance, uh, we don't get any search results, but we got get something that looks like an answer. Um, and we might accept this answer without even reconsidering that it's from AI and might not be the best solution or might not even be untrue. So I do think that we need to learn ourselves and teach users how to interact with AI, how to believe or not to believe an answer that is given by a voice assistant or that happens to be in the feed. Um, so we need to trigger users for asking for explanations, for looking for alternatives, etc. So I think humans and AI is a very important topic and the interface plays a central role here. Lots of uh, interest. We could talk like uh, the, the whole night about this uh, really interesting topic, but perhaps, uh, thank you, Elko, uh, perhaps back to the initial uh, uh, topic about uh, 
academia industry and other uh, domains collaborating. And this goes out to uh, Mr. Liras, uh, Keith and uh, Rosie about how, what are the lessons to be learned about how do you provide incentive motivation for both um, parts of this uh, interaction? And uh, what are the lessons that you have learned from your experience? Uh, Keith has been on both sides and uh, uh, Mr. Liras also, perhaps. Uh, what would you suggest that we uh, support and reinforce this uh, collaboration? How do we set up the, the domain? P perhaps uh, Rosie, then Mr. Liras and uh, Keith. Hello. Uh, if I would like to, I would like to, to comment and uh, share my thoughts on on this. First of all, we, as I stated, um, we live in a world of opportunities, in many many opportunities. So uh, today conference, today discussion, it's a great opportunity to share the same vision and collaborate uh, in order to live in a sustainable way. And when I'm, um, in my opinion, live in a sustainable way for a sustainable future entails the, all the concept of responsibility. We have all to be responsible against um, and, uh, new technologies and uh, we have to be inclusive on what the future brings and what the future requires. So we have to invest to our next generation, to our to our um, <clears throat> to our children. We have to collaborate together. We have to hear their voice and the um, collaboration, uh, responsibility, and sustainability are the three main topics. I would uh, I would say that is needed at um, for, for the future. Thank you, Rosie. Keith, what are your thoughts on this? Uh, yeah, so it, it's great because I, you I had see... the vast experience on both sides, so you right. you, you know the, the, the both domains. Right. So so yeah. So there's challenges. You know, different. You know, industry works at a different pace than academia, and so on. So so there's definitely challenges. But as I've been talking to people over the years, there's lots of examples where this collaboration is happening. It's sort of like you know what triggered this was I, I saw the the all the awesome things you were doing as Kai Greece, and I elevated it to Elizabeth to talk about it at the global level. Right. So one thing I think we need to do is find all these examples of the collaboration that are already happening. Right, because it is happening. It's just we're not aware of it. So, so documenting some of that one, similar to what it's we're not doing, exactly with... industry though. Uh, that that's my yes, kind of. Okay, so so yeah, so w w if it is happening, we should document it and we could elevate it like we're doing with MedKai to elevate things. Do we need to do more collaboration? Yes, we do. So we need to find folks that have common goals and, you know, initiate things either from the SIGKAI perspective or from the industry perspective. I know in, in industry, they collaborate a lot by, by forming these consortiums where companies get together with common goals and they put money into a pot and they fund a consortium of 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 as an industry level right not just as 20 companies but those 20 companies acting together is a larger force usually academic groups don't participate in that right so so there's ways that that industry are elevating their influence and there's ways that academia is in elevating their influence and we need to combine those so that's just at a, at a high level thank you keith uh mr Lewis. Messing with your microphone. <laughs> um, okay, I'll 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 provide a perspective from from my point of view, and that is that uh, collaboration is a problem in the in the, in the software industry because the technology of the software industry doesn't lend itself to merging different people's work. I think it's a technology problem. I can't hire somebody to send me over some code that I can merge with something else very easily. In fact, when I first started in this business about 27 years ago, after being in the shipping industry as an investor and an operator, 
uh, we had to incorporate a manual into some sort of document management system. We had to write that code from the beginning. I think there must have been 100,000 companies in the world that were actually using manuals in a document management system. We had to write it again. The reason why we had to write it again is because the way software is written, it doesn't lend itself to being merged. So I think that one of the, uh, uh, let's say, foundations of the problem of neat, uh, and monolithic systems as well, where one person builds something that incorporates everything and the next company does exactly the same thing and nothing gets merged, is a technological reason. I think there's a technological reason why the industry is disjointed. So, uh, unless there's something else, uh, that's that. So, thank you for your patience. Uh, thank you, the, the, the audience. Thank you, the panelists, and you up there. Uh, it's been uh, really an, an honor, a privilege to, to chair this uh, highlight, this gem of the conference and the uh, Kai Greece uh, and Greek Kai community uh, um, um, highlight. Thanks again. Thank you very much. Thank you. S some uh, practicalities. Uh, now it's the uh, Med Medkai Committee uh, inaugural meeting, and uh, we're having drinks at nine o'clock at. Uh, it's close, but uh, cruiser, cruiser.